Sure. Okay, so uh, this is Peter O'Rourke with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, and we'll be commencing our virtual training series on incident level symbology. Um, the uh, presenter today, the trainer today, is Lieutenant Chris Rogers of the Kirkland, Washington Fire Department. Um, Chris is also the uh, regional lead, the chairman of the Pacific Northwest NAPSIG regional leadership team. Um, so with that introduction, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Peter and stuff, and thanks everybody for attending this webinar and stuff. This is kind of a, a, an accumulation of the work that we've done the past couple of years with the Incident Symbology Work Group. And, um, you know, I kind of want to cover a couple things today, and really it's going to be kind of a relatively short presentation. I don't want to bog this down and make this a... Um, big, long training discussion. So the two goals I have today are, one, quickly explain the, the guideline or symbols guideline. I say quickly because if any guideline or any training and stuff, if you uh, spend more than like a half an hour explaining something, then you kind of lost the message. Also, I want to demonstrate some resources that you use to uh, implement the guideline. Uh, just a little bit about me. Peter already covered it and stuff. But I just kind of wanted to show the ESRI map widget that you put in a PowerPoint slide. So Kirkland's right here. And I'm right next to Seattle, so if anybody has any questions what Kirkland is. Also, a little fact is that when you go to Costco, Kirkland Signature is actually named after Kirkland because that's where Costco started. Now, here's the uh, standard disclaimer. This is a presentation about a guideline and not a standard. But the hope is that the guideline can help help responder groups enhance their standards. Uh, you know, emergency services is a pretty broad industry, and it would be nearly impossible to create a standard symbol for every single thing possible. Um, you know, eventually you'll be doing symbols for sharks with lasers and zombies and everything else. So what we wanted to do is create a guideline that provides a framework for symbology so that we have some flexibility and scalability. Um, responders really need maps for four reasons. They need maps to identify where they need to go to fix a problem. They need to show where equipment is or where things are located that help solve a problem. Uh, they also need to identify features that help fix a problem like a fire hydrant or a standpipe connection for the fire service. And they also need to identify hazards that cause harm. And that's actually really important because ultimately every responder's job is to be safe and to go home. And so our group came up with three guidelines or three groups of symbols. We have incident symbology, which has some three subcategories I'll go to here in a little bit. Um, Pre-incident symbology, which kind of has its roots in uh, fire service pre-incident planning, but uh, is also pollinated with some other groups, and also hazard mapping. And really that's a very subjective responder safety uh, bit of information that uh, is used for uh, just identifying something that could either hurt us or that we need to fix. And so the symbols category for incident features, we have basically three subcategories. We have NIMS symbology, which is like the, the, consistent with the National Incident Management System, unit symbology, and command feature location. Um, two key things that need to kind of remember is that it's a clear background. The reason why that is is that um, at an incident, you're not likely to have technology to have robust symbology. You know, you have you need to be able to use paper. And so, also, I'll just go back to it here in a little bit. You need something that's a bit scalable and flexible. So you see in the, the demonstration on the right, um, the symbol is saying the same thing. It's basically the staging symbol, and it's just noted at the location with a clear circle. So incident features in the incident features subcategory of incident symbology um, is really features that help support the incident. And we note that with a clear circle, again, that could be hand drawable. And the two th key things we need to remember on that is that it's where either people should go or where people are located and where equipment is located. And so examples, and we use standards that already exist. For example, you know, base, emergency shelter, which is a, actually an Australian symbol, staging, the uh, fire hydrant symbol, and some other symbols, ad hoc symbols uh, that already existed are basically a clear circle with some acronym in the middle. I mean, now, you can see here that, again, it allows us some flexibility to modify the symbol and is that also offers some consistency. Hmm. 
However, you do need to have some, some ability to modify the symbol or have um, the symbol mean something else. For example, again, this is something borrowed kind of from the uh, Australian uh, guideline. Uh, it was actually a kind of a neat idea to have a dashed line around a symbol. And really that um, shows something that could happen in the future. It's not in use yet or it's planned. So, for example, um, if you wanted to know, like, hey, I'm going to put staging here as an incident commander, but it doesn't exist yet, but I just want it right there, I could draw an S and then just do a, draw, uh, a dash line around that S. And then when it's in service, I could just fill in the line. Chris, uh, also, we have a Go ahead, Peter. Uh, Interrupt. We have a question. I think a clarification more than anything. Um, when you're talking about the circles, should the circle be clear as in transparent, or are we talking white as an empty circle? Um, it should be white, and it should be um, – the reason why it is, based on our, our experimentation and stuff, you need to plan on base maps to be an aerial photo. And so if it works that you don't need a, a white background, you just draw hand draw it, it, it looks okay, like on a, on a clear, on a white formatted base map, and that's okay. But for GIS purposes, it should be a white background. Does that make sense? It does answer the question. Okay, cool. So another modifier, simple modifier, is – Clear text and clear text is a common term used in the uh, NIMS communication model. You know, instead of using ten codes or other type of codes, we adopted a model of having clear text for our radio traffic. Well, why not in symbology have clear text? And so, you know, in this instance, we have civ, which you know people maybe could do, deduce that that's civilian, and then at the bottom you just write down clear text for staging. Um, I'll show you another example here in a little bit. Also, uh, you could use arrows to enhance the symbology. In this case, it, it denotes direction. In this case, you want people to go towards that symbol. Uh, incident command locations, this is where the person who is in charge of a certain function of an incident is located. And it's a clear rectangle, which is also consistent with uh, military symbology. And it's the location of the person in charge. And then unit symbology is a clear oval, and it's used to map the location of the unit working. So, for example, if you, you're mapping a fire engine company doing work at a structure fire, you want to map where the crew is versus where the engine is. However, it could exist that the crew and the engine are co-located together, so it's, that's just where uh, a little thing we can account with. Also, this will be really effective when passive data is collected. For example, right now it's really not practical to map the location of units in, a, in an incident since it's so dynamic unless you had some kind of technology like AVL or GPS locating devices. But again, here there's a lot of latitude in creating the symbol. Um, so, but again, it's a clear oval, but it's usually, we're usually recommending denoting it by the unit type. And then if you wanted to iconicize, it'll make a graphic a little bit. You can put a, a little ambulance in the back. And even you can get down to the personnel level. Now, there's always kind of exceptions to the guideline. And so this is one exception we definitely came up with is the command post. And it's not a circle. And, and so, But it was, it's been used so much that it's actually a, a recognizable symbol. So we just recommended as a group that we had uh, clear text at the bottom to explain it, in, case, in this case, CP. Also, um, color. You know, if the color meant something in the incident, like uh, green for a uh, green patient, this is the uh, treatment section, uh, then it, you know, it makes sense to have some color to the symbology. Now, the other thing that we recommended as a group is, you know what, if it looks like a hydrant on a map, it must be a fire hydrant. So sometimes, you know, when it comes to symbols, people will kind of get – very oneristic about what type of uh, look of symbol they want to use, and frankly, we just didn't care. We, if, if it looked like it, if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it must be a duck. The next broad category is hazards, and actually this is the most important category because, again, like I said, uh, responder safety is, you know, everybody wants to go home. So we used a reserved shape of a diamond, and the reason why that is is that Hazard symbology already kind of exists in the diamond format. For example, the NFPA 704, 
uh, DOT hazmat placarding, even the DHS incident symbology, really most of that incident symbology is hazard mapping. And then even in practical daily life, you know, road signs are diamonds. And I think the reason why that is is because diamonds are an easy shape to distinguish from other shapes. And pre-planned features, it really has its roots in the um, uh, fire service uh, based on FPA standard 1620. And the differentiator from incident symbology is it has a color background. And the reason why that is is that, you know, you should have time if you pre-plan or go out in the field and collect data. Even if you hand draw a map, you should have time to color it in with a crayon or use a graphics program or use a GIS package to to create that symbol or to map that symbol. So based on the NFPA 1620 categories, we have uh, six categories of actually has seven categories of uh, pre-planned symbols, a uh, green triangle or green square for access features. In this case, it would be attic access, roof access. And we add modifiers to it as well, like um, – let me bring up my pin real quick – like uh, an L for a ladder, or we can use clear text as well. Uh, a flat diamond for detectors of building extinguishment systems, uh, a gray square for geographic features within a building. In this case, uh, it could be, you know, this symbol, AC is, is um, air conditioner or emergency generator right here or boiler room. And those are all standard NFPA or industry-specific uh, symbols. Um, uh, fire suppression symbols we noted with a red circle. Uh, feature shutoffs are a blue triangle, and ventilation features, you know, features that help exhaust smoke or other chemical vapors, and if somebody's actually reading the slide, they'll notice something else. Um, a purple, uh, purple triangle, and then a red triangle for alarms. So in this case, we're going to go through a scenario of actually creating a, a symbol for an incident feature. First, we establish the clear circle. And then we use a common accepted, commonly accepted acronym for a feature. In this case, we'll use EVAC, which is something that people probably can deduce uh, even reading the map. If we wanted to find it further, we could add the word shelter at the bottom, so it's like an evacuation shelter. And from there, we could denote the direction of where that feature is. For example, you might actually be mapping something that's not at that location, but if you have a, uh, a feature that's off the map, you could just put it on the map and then give a direction where it needs to go to. And also, if it's a place where people need to congregate, you can just put arrows going towards it. And if the map scale is such that it needs to be a little bit smaller, you could do something like this. In this example, you know, it's a hazard. And, you know, actually, the diamond is pretty convenient because if you have decision makers or people responding to an incident and you really don't have um, time or a chance to um, train people on symbology or they don't have a ledger or something like that, you can just tell lay people just, hey, avoid diamonds on the map. And so in this case, you could use clear text for uh, the hazard, you know, what it represents. You could use some arrows or some symbology, or you could just use like an exclamation point just to say, hey, there's a hazard here. And again, you could scale it down, and it could be even hand drawable and stuff. We just hand draw a diamond and says cliff. It's something that kind of differentiates it apart and sets it apart. And the final example I have is a pre-planned symbol, which is, again, a, a color background. And you could change the acronym in the middle based on uh, what type of alarm feature it is. And you could actually add some descriptive text in the bottom as well, like it's in the office. And you could add a modifier right here to denote what kind of control panel it is. So, and then again, you can scale it down to um, – the uh, scale down smaller so it could fit on the map. So you see we kind of came up with something that's flexible and scalable. And again, it's a guideline, not a standard. So each industry or each responder group can kind of tailor this to what they need. Also, don't forget that, you know, a legend is that's what it's for to know what the symbol represents. And in the GIS world, you can click on it to check out what the attribute is. So some resources available. This is uh, resources that we came up with as a group. Uh, we have a picture-sharing website uh, that hosts a lot of the symbology in 
a PNG format 120 by 120. Also, we have uh, the Napsic ArcGIS Online account uh, that has a lot of, all this stuff on here. And I'll show that in a little bit as well. And then hopefully uh, we'll get some of the stuff in the Resource Center. And then a pencil and paper is not out of style. So if you have any questions, you know, there's my email address. And if you on Twitter, there's uh, it's a map hoser. And uh, then let me, I'm going to go through a couple other demonstrations real quick and then open it up for questions. So I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to show a way to, I'm going to show you the symbols, the uh, fire mapping website. And hopefully, and Peter, you can see the website, correct? My yeah, we see the web. Okay. So if you go to symbols.firemapping.com, that's the, the, the location now for where I've been putting the, the symbology. And so, the neat thing about this is, is that you could, in Google Earth or ArcGIS.com or ArcGIS Explorer, you could use this as a source to, to download symbols directly into the map, and I'll demonstrate that here in a little bit. So if, say, for example, so you click on here, I have it based in categories, and I just uploaded a bunch of the stuff last night as well, So, but it's open to the public. I don't have comments set it on, set on it yet, but I, I probably will here in a bit. And so you could just click on the symbol and use it directly in the map. And let me demonstrate that here. I'll just show it in Google Earth here real quick. Let's say, for example, and I don't recommend this for actually mapping data or maintaining data, but if you need to do a, like a quick and dirty map of like a hazard and then email it off to somebody, I could uh, open and zoom to the map uh, location where I want. In this case, that's Mailbox Peak, which actually is above the, my fire academy right here. And then I can come here and I can go, like, you know what? I got, um, let's say I got wires overhead. I don't know I'm going to pick that one, but I got wires overhead here. I'm going to right click on this. And this is Chrome, but you could do this in Internet Explorer or Firefox. Internet Explorer is a little bit more difficult. Um, but you can copy the image URL, and then here I'm going to add a place mark in Google Earth and say, you know what, I got a got wires. I'm just going to type in wires, and to make the symbol mean something, uh, you know what, I did that wrong. So I just go into the icon and add the URL directly into this map, and it shows up on the map. So from here, <coughs> I have this. I'm using the symbology directly uh, in Google Earth, and then I can e either email this to somebody or um, uh, communicate this information to somebody else. Again, I don't. I'm not a big fan of using this to maintain data. But if you want something quick and dirty and send it to somebody, this is a pretty useful tool to use. The other thing I'll show you is the NAPSIG Foundation. All the work that we're doing, we're putting on the NAPSIG um, Foundation uh, ArcGIS.com site. And if you go to NAPSIG.maps.ArcGIS.com, you'll locate that. And then I created a public group uh, for the Incident Symbology Guideline. And when it loads, there it is. Um, it, you know, it has uh, the feature services um, that are, you know made public, uh, some sample maps, and actually links to this presentation in YouTube, and also links to the public safety symbols list on uh, symbols.firemapping.com. And if you want to, a uh, little tip or a little advice, I'll, I'm also putting map packages and layer packages on here as well. Make sure that you set all con uh, the show all content versus web content. As you can see, if you just show web content, it only show it will not show the layer packages and map packages. It only show um, feature services and web maps. And so, uh, I'll give a demo demo map real quick of how to use some of the stuff in ArcGIS.com. And again, I made this public to everybody. I just created a demo map for mapping hazards. And it's kind of slow today. Well, it, it's slow, Chris, just because of the uh, WebEx technology slows things down. Yeah, it, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. 
So you see here are the feature services I've added to the map, and you could edit this. And again, this is a this is public, so you know don't you know don't use this to try out and test and and play with, but don't use this for your your services because it it's not a good way to do it. Um, and WebEx is slowing it down. Eventually, in three, two, one, now. Those icons would come up. Now, does anybody have any questions I can answer while that, that thing's coming up? We have a couple questions. Uh, so, can this be used uh, to the Web EOC mapper as well? Uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm not quite familiar with um, that techno their technology and stuff. It, it's it's open and it's Esri based technology, um, and so. It should, but I've all, I've I don't I can't give you a definitive answer on that one. But it, so it Rob, be. Robert, uh, if you want, if that's a, a important to you, um, we can circle back and try to find the answer to that. Uh, Karen Turin actually did provide an answer that says Web EOC Mapper can consume a map service that contains this um, symbology. So uh, according to uh, to Karen, we we should be able to do that. Um, cool. Another question, Chris, for you. Although this popped up, why don't we? Why don't you keep going? Then we'll ask um, the remaining questions. Okay. Well, yeah, I just hit it. I just closed that out again. I don't know why I did that. Well, like like any good demonstration, something's got to hit as a bug. Edit. Well, this old play act, even when it edits, a dialog box comes up on the left with some draggable icons, and it will, it will you can populate the map based on um, what the uh, feature service has. Also, if you wanted to add features to the map, you could search um, based on keyword. And this, you know, this is kind of what steenabarkjs.com is, is that you can um, search either through your organization if you have this, or search all public data that's hosted on this and stuff. So. Um, you know, I'll give an example of fire stations, and I put this keyword in because uh, you know you could actually add data that uh, belongs to somebody else, and. Uh, just, just do fire stations. So anyway, so you can actually add other people's data to your map. Yeah. So, um, so again, yeah. So you can add just features um, to the map that already exist from other places. So anyway, um, those are the two things I wanted to show. Again, I wanted to make it kind of quick and easy so that people didn't get uh, bored by an hour-long presentation and stuff. Uh, if you've got any questions, Peter, do you have anything else at all? Or I do yeah. One um, just uh, uh, question would be: Can you go back to the resources slide? Um, some folks missed some of the information you had there, um, mm -hmm. and leave maybe leave that up for a second. Sure. Um, another uh, recommendation to us that I'll share with the group um, is that a good practice might be to create a font file, a, a TTF, so that it can be used in a deck desktop app. Um, so that's a bit of um, a suggestion for you. And I guess yeah. You know, fortunately I used um, all the, I have a style sheet as well that um, uses, I, I, I've never created anything new. I've just used a complex symbology and, and desktop. And I'll, I'll make that style sheet available. Uh, you know, the, I, I haven't quite figured out how to put a style sheet on ArcGIS.com yet. Uh, and so I think that what we'll do is, you know, as a map package, you know, you'll have that embedded into the map, and they can create a style sheet from that uh, separately. But I, I haven't quite figured out how to share a style sheet yet. Okay. Well, maybe that's something we can uh, – Joaquin um, uh, made that suggestion, and I'm presuming this is the same Joaquin who does uh, some real excellent wildfire um, apps. So maybe Joaquin, you and I can talk about that. 
Um, another question uh, from uh, Louisiana DOT is uh, what about um, surveillance cameras in field view and, and um, in particular, have we adopted or thought about intelligent transportation symbology? You know, um, not yet. You know, we did we did discuss in the group um, sensor symbology, and it was still a circle, but we kind of adopted, you know, keeping it hand drawable. We um, adopted um, kind of a modified look based on the DHS, DHS symbology. So. And their sensor um, symbols were a circle with a couple of half circles built into it, and then they had an icon in the middle, which would be kind of drop the hand draw. But we just said that, you know, as a modifier for sensor uh, symbology, the the root symbol of the circle with the kind of a couple of semicircles into it would be um, uh, would be acceptable. But we did not make that a high priority in our, our discussion. Okay. Um, Dean just got back to me and he gave us a link for um, where we can do some free software to create TTF files. So what maybe what we can do is add that to the um, resources page here. And for those of you who are asking whether or not this presentation will be made available, um, we'll put it into a, a format that, that's downloadable for everybody and make this available as well as the recording. Um, Chris, another question then for you. Um, I think you've already answered this, but has an ArcGIS symbol, a symbol library been created? Um, and that's that. We already did go to that, right? That was your. Uh, yeah, um, I, I I do have a, a style sheet that I've created. That I'll make available. I'm trying to figure out how to share it, and then I'm trying to work with Esri to get this available in the resource center, and also even. So, Ryan, if you're still on, we'll, we'll probably have that discussion next month um, okay. uh, as well. And then, you know, we'll get together on that one. Okay. And then another question is, can you just demonstrate again how you uh, linked uh, the actual symbol into Bing um, with the wires example? That was something that uh, was of interest. You were a little quick draw, apparently. You know, I could do that in Google Maps. I don't think I could do – I can't do that in Bing. You know, I, I didn't even try that. Let me try um, – so I'll, I'll redemonstrate Google Maps or Google Earth real quick. So what you want to do is create a um, a place marker, basically a point, and then just create a place mark. And what it does is it defaults to the last symbol used. You want to – Click this button in the upper right-hand corner to change the symbol, and what it does is it shows the the symbols that are canned with with um, Google Earth. If you want to add a custom icon, you get the uh, URL to the, the icon for that. So I'll go back to symbols, the symbols um, website, and we'll pick out another one. So um, you know, in this case, we'll just do a you know, I'm going to do the command post. I want to show actually the health health spot would be good. Um, that's the health spot. We'll just use that one because we'll assume there's actually a helipad there. You know, right click on that um, image in uh, Firefox and Chrome. It's pretty easy. There's a menu option to copy the image URL for. Um, um, Internet Explorer, you actually have to open up the properties and then copy it from the properties dialog in uh, Google uh, Internet Explorer. So you just copy the image URL, go back to Google Earth, paste it, and then hit OK. And it, you know, so again, that shows the um, the icon you just downloaded. Um, I'm also looking at the chat panel. Can you do this in ArcGIS? Yes, you can. Actually, I'll demonstrate that real quick. Just so you know, the response to what you just showed was, wow, thanks. So that's good. Okay. So let me bring up ArcMap here real quick. And also, um, um, keep in mind that to use the ArcGIS.com environment fully, you, you do need 10.1 to to leverage um, everything. You'd use some things, but like the map packages and layer packages, you need, I'm, since I'm using 10.1, you need to use 10.1. Um, I'll just demonstrate briefly. I'll just open up a map here real quick. 
and I want to change a symbol. And I, it takes a little bit more work and stuff, but if you see, um, I'll just modify the aerial hazard symbol, which is, this is derived from um, the NWCG symbology, but I did take some liberties and add a diamond to it. You bring up, you know, change the symbol selector, and then you edit the symbol. And then what you're going to have to do is actually download the, um, the uh, image locally to your hard drive since it doesn't accept yeah, web URLs and then from there you just um, store it in a folder in your hard drive and then navigate to it and, and select it. So uh, hopefully I answered that question. Um, Chris, uh, just a couple things I can touch on here. Um, uh, we have a question about Virtual USA and these symbols uh, being used in Virtual USA. Um, this, the answer to that is I really don't know. Uh, we, we are certainly in some fashion involved with Virtual USA. We're, we're NAPSIG is part of that transition of Virtual USA out of DHS in, in, in an advisory capacity. They just ask us what we think about a few things. Um, and, and the original funding to do this way back to host a meeting, um, they, they paid for travel, was done by the same folks that do Virtual USA. So they're involved with this, uh, how that translates into them utilizing this methodology or, or some of the symbols that result is something that um, we we're hopeful we can continue that discussion. I just don't know where it's going to lead. Um, and Al uh, Stutt uh, asked a question. I, I think, Al, you have this, this comment cut and paste pretty quickly. I see this almost exact verbiage about U.S. National Grid. Um, as I think I've mentioned to Al, but I'll share with the rest of the community, um, NAPSIG Foundation is working on a U.S. National Grid implementation guidance document, which should be released towards the end of the summer. Um, that's a document that we're trying to put out there to help people just basically understand what USNG is, um, where it came from, and how it can be uh, implemented in your uh, agency. And so hopefully, Al, that um, uh, makes it not a missed opportunity, but we try to comment on U.S. National Grid wherever we can. Um, let me see where else. Uh, there is a question is, is there a written document uh, that talks about this guideline? Um, we don't have a written document per se because we're not necessarily creating a standard, but we do have things like this PowerPoint, the firemapping.com um, site, and things like that. There was a report written by FEMA a couple years ago that outlines what we're doing here, uh, but we're not trying to um, create actually a, uh, a report on this because it's, this is an evolutionary process and we're really kind of just starting. Yeah. Um, so let me think what else we have. I'm trying to see what else we have here in terms of questions. We kind of got a lot right at the last second. I don't know if you see anything that you haven't addressed yet, Chris. Um, I see from Patricia, has anyone to your knowledge created annotation databases out of symbols? Or do you use them? Uh, are you referring to uh, using true type fonts in the symbology? Or uh, maybe I need more help with that question, Patricia. Hopefully, you're typing. So yeah, maybe actually, why don't you answer Pettit's question if you if you can? Who's, who's, who's question? Uh, Don wrote, "What is the relationship between this symbol uh, symbology demonstrated and NAPSIG? Um, are these endorsed or adopted at this point, or are they proposed or under development?" Maybe I can answer that actually. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, this is we have a symbology working group. Um, that uh, the way NAPSIG is organized is we don't have a big hierarchy. Uh, there are only there's a board of directors and then a couple staff. So really, what we do uh, within NAPSIG is take our guidance from primarily our local partners. And um, uh, so Chris and a bunch of other local public safety officials came up with this concept. So NAPSIG is helping um, you know through our regions develop this concept. Um, but it's not something that necessarily is an, an endorsed, endorsed or adopted or whatever. It's just something we work on. It's not a standard. Um, it's something that we try to develop, and then 
like in, in occasions like this put out to the community and if it's something you find valuable we take input from you we change it we tweak it um, people can uh, use it disregard it um, hopefully you provide input so we can make it better and it becomes usable for all um, Chris I saw Patricia did respond to your question yeah taking labeling you join to other fields and then exporting it as a set of skills and chat it the send off yeah, I might not have had another coffee. I'm sure that's a pretty simple question, and I'm just totally brain farting a little bit. So um, I'll tell you, I'll copy and paste your question, and then the noodle kind of separate from that. I guess. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll have. A, why don't you just shoot me an email real quick, and I'll give you my phone number, and you could ask me. Um, I'm having a. Um, I'm having a somewhat trucky moment which means refers to being a ladder truck for 15 years. <laughs> um, let me see what other questions we might have, Chris. Uh, I think we've gotten to most of them here. Uh, yes, as I mentioned to folks who maybe right. didn't get on um, got on a little later, this will be this is being recorded right now, and it will be posted um, for everyone to to download. Um, it looks like we have covered all of the questions. Uh, Chris, do you see anything else we haven't covered? No, you know, and I just I kind of wanted to keep it simple. Just uh, like I said, I think you know. It's been my experience that you lose uh, people if you make the training. Um, you know, if you explain this and it takes an hour for to explain this, then you really um, have it whittled it down. So I, you know, I'm I'm happy to keep it under an hour with discussion. So this is good. Great. Um, so we'll just give it one more second. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, it looks like we're good, although we just got a whole bunch of stuff, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we haven't uh, missed anyone. If we have missed anyone, please um, do note that uh, Chris's email is there. Uh, also, you can contact me. You, you should all have my information. I'm going to take the, the presentation rights back, Chris, now, if that's all right okay. with you. That's and fine. I'm just going to show everybody on my desktop here. Uh, tell me once you see my desktop. Um, this is the NAPSIG, NAPSIG Foundation website, uh, www.napsigfoundation.org, and where we post these, um, the recordings of all these events are under latest news, so you can see the social media and GIS first um, in the series from last week is there, uh, the GII is there as well, and then any other additional information you might want to know about NAPSIG or, or otherwise is available at this site. Um, I would just recommend anyone who finds this particular subject of interest, and if you are um, desire to get involved more with NAPSIG generally or symbology in particular, please reach out to me or Chris. We do have a working group that meets. Um, the next meeting is actually going to be uh, concurrent with the uh, ESRI user conference, or actually just before the uh, National Security Summit out in San Diego, so you're welcome to participate in that. Um, but we're uh, certainly a more of the merrier type group, and we look forward to uh, anyone who wants to participate in this to participate. Um, that being said, Chris, anything more from you? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you to everyone um, for participating. We know you guys have busy schedules and you're, you're uh, active in your day job, so thank you for taking the time to participate in this. Uh, and thank you uh, most to Chris for all the hard work he puts into uh, both his day job and to NAPSIG Foundation. Uh, his leadership is, is really uh, crucial to our ability to serve the community. So thank you to everyone, and that will conclude this particular session.